This broadcast of the North Idaho College Public Forum, a student production. Your moderator is North Idaho College political scientist, Tony Stewart. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It is a special privilege to welcome to our program uh, this evening, Dr. Richard Farson, who is one of the best known futurists within our country. He has a reputation for many years of dealing with liberation or advocating liberation of various groups within our society. For example, many years ago, he was dealing with the question of women and their rights before it became uh, the fad to do so. His most recent work in the form of publication has dealt with the rights of children and what we should be doing in that area. He is now commencing work in the field of talking about animals and their rights within our society. As to background, Dr. Farson holds a PhD in the field of psychology from the University of Chicago. His present position is a faculty member on the Humanistic Psychology Institute in San Francisco, California. He has written numerous articles and books, his latest book entitled Birth Rights, Dealing with the Rights of Children, and as I've indicated, can certainly be classified as a most well-known futurist within our country. Dr. Farson, it's a pleasure having you on our program. Pleasure to be here. Also joining me in quizzing our guest this evening will be Mr. Bob Brown, who is the director of the placement service of the North Idaho College Vocational Programs. Uh, Bob, welcome to the program. Thank you, Tony. And also Janelle Burke, who is a regular panel member, will be once again questioning our guest. Welcome, Janelle. Thank you, Tony. We'll proceed to questions at once, and the first series will come from Bob Brown. Dr. Farson, this morning you, know, you were discussing uh, <coughs> the work that's being done with chimpanzees and sign language, and how, how much uh, we are beginning to find out that chimpanzees perhaps can communicate with humans more than we thought. I wonder if you'd be willing to share some of the results of that work with the viewing audience today? Well, it's quite a burgeoning field in, uh, in psychology now. I don't, I'm not well acquainted with it, but uh, I am acquainted enough to know certain little anecdotes about it. And uh, the, I think the fundamental uh, amazing fact is that, uh, that when chimpanzees, or in some cases apes, are taught signs that the deaf people are taught in, just like the deaf people are taught in, in, uh, in our society, uh, they learn them and uh, can use them and will use them with their trainers and even with each other. And uh, they, they can learn three, four hundred of these signs, which is uh, quite a large vocabulary. And they'll do things like being able to take and, and uh, and, and invent new terms. For example, if they've never seen uh, an apple, they and but they do have a word for orange and a word for round, they will s call an apple a round, uh, uh, no, a word for red, not round, a word for red, then they'll call an apple a red orange or something like that. So they're able to do these fairly high level things that little children can't often, often do, you know, very small children can't do, and they call a ring a finger bracelet or a, a a mask, an eye hat, and then they do other things too. They they uh, they lie when they get caught, uh, and they will lie in sign language. And they, uh, I was interested the other day. Uh, uh, Roger Fouts from the University of Oklahoma was telling me that that uh, they sometimes use the sign for feces, the dirty sign. They call it. Uh, to apply to human beings that they don't like, which I thought was kind of, kind of amusing. <clears throat> but it is an extraordinary event in psychology to discover the complicated uh, ways in which they can use our language. And that, for me, is, is not unlike discovering the Martians among us. I mean, there's just a... a, a it, 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 it asks of me, I don't know whether everybody else has the same reaction or not, but it asks of me some pretty uh, serious uh, questioning of um, what, it, what the difference is between us, because the, the fact is uh, that they, 
can do things that lots of little children can't do and lots of retarded adults can't do. Would you say, uh, are you familiar with any correlation between the work with the dolphins that they've, they've done over the many years and say this? Are they working together at the, all? I don't think the same people are doing the, the, the work uh, by and large. I'm sure they're influenced by each other's work. But uh, the dolphins uh, apparently have uh, extraordinary intelligence. However, it's never been of this sort that where they can communicate in our language to us, which is a very different experience, just psychologically a different experience. You have a, a chimpanzee saying uh, about a pipe smoking uh, laboratory system that Roger smells bad. That's a, an unusual uh, a human event, even if it's non-human. So, uh, I think what it means is that uh, here's another instance in which we have to take a hard look at the ethics, the morality that is connected with the range of our relationships to the animal world, which is quite extensive. I mean, we have a hundred million dogs and cats, we have, which are treated very, very differently. We have. Uh, uh, animal experimentation, where we kill 100 million animals and testing our products and medicines and so forth, uh, putting on demonstrations in classrooms. We have an enormous problem with uh, wildlife and the conservation of it. Uh, we have a, a, a whole issue with beasts of burden, with animal shows, rodeos, gazoo, zoos, and things like that, dog fights, cock fights. Uh, we put animals through quite an ordeal, not unlike the ordeal of slavery. Hard of us to think of animals as slaves, but um, there are very many parallels in, in some ways. Uh, so uh, that's a long answer to your question about sign language and chimps. But uh, well, just carrying on one more question: Do you think that if if uh, people broke that barrier, say if someone could talk to a, a dog? and have it respond in some way, do you think maybe the people's attitudes might be quite different toward those animals? For example, if you had a parakeet in a cage and some the parakeet communicated to you, uh, I'm really tired of being in this cage, I'd like to fly around a bit, do you think that what effect would that have on this whole picture of animal experimentation? If the rodeo, for example, if the, if the bull says, I don't wish to be the uh, bucking uh, bull anymore, <clears throat> what would people do, do you think? That's a, uh, that's a question we don't know the answer to. Uh, I don't think it would stop us, personally, because we have certainly heard that from other humans, and we continue to do things to humans that we know that they don't want done to them. Uh, it's, it, takes a, it takes another leap of consciousness, I think, uh, beyond that simple one to build a real new ethical code out of it. I, do, I don't think that. We have an amazing ability to to compartmentalize and to dissociate. We can take litter mates from, from a little litter of puppies or kittens or something and give one to uh, a child who will just pamper it and love it to death and treat it well the rest of its life and cry bitter tears when its, when its life is over. And we'll give the other, another kitten out of the same litter to an animal experimenter who will uh, without anesthetic, uh, do all kinds of outrageous things to test some new cosmetic or something like that. It, it's a, it's not at all. Uh, uh, it, it's a kind of a schizophrenia we all live with. Our ability to do that sort of thing is is quite, quite uh, strong. I think. Janelle Burke. There is a balance in nature, and I wonder if you might co uh, comment on this balance in nature and how humans and animals alike fit into this balance. Well, I think that's, of course, what's happening now. We have a new consciousness of our place in the, in the food chain, our place in the ecological balance. Uh, it's one which we're beginning to question whether we really have dominion over animals and plants and the earth uh, that was guaranteed us by our, uh, the Bible. Uh, we're, we're beginning to question all that now. 
And we begin to see how every time we intervene and try to do something, even for very benign and uh, well-intended purposes, how that really very often ends in uh, new problems for us. When we try to, say, drop hay to the starving elk in Yellowstone, uh, we find uh, that does indeed make it possible for them to survive, but we continue to kill off all the wolves. And so the wolves uh, who, who have as much right to life, it would seem, as the elk, except they are not quite as beautiful, perhaps, to some people. They're not as glamorous a, 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 a species issue. And so for that reason, we go ahead and let them die off. And now there aren't enough wolves, and there are too many elk. And we don't know what to do about things like that. Every time we intervene, we make a new problem. And it's very hard. These are, in a sense, these aren't problems. They're predicaments we're in. Our whole relationship to the animal world is not one that can be solved with a few laws or a few new principles. That we can't solve them because they're not problems in the first place. They're mysteries. They're dilemmas. They're predicaments. And we are, like most human affairs, they're predicaments. They're not problems. But as Americans, we keep thinking we can solve them as problems. We keep thinking they divide up neatly into little problems, and then we can solve them. But marriage is not a solvable problem. It's a predicament. Child rearing is not solvable. It's a predicament. And our relationship to the animal world is too big, too complex. We've gone too far with it now to, to regard it as a problem. We can't do anything in a single generation of animals, for example, to solve these problems. We have 100 million dogs and cats. Now, we can't kill them all. Well, I guess we could, but uh, that would be a terrible price to pay. For one thing, we spend $2.5 billion on pet food. Now, what happens to the economy when we take a big bite out of it like that? It's serious. I think, Dr. Uh, Parson, this would be a good time to stop, and maybe we should even open up the program with this question. And we have more questions on animals and then the, your work with children and, uh, and the role of women in our society and so forth. But in the presentation you gave to the student body, you gave what I thought was a very clear and very uh, commendable definition about uh, especially our relation to other human beings and, and to other animals. This uh, would fit, too, very appropriately in how you define how does one uh, uh, deal with others. You were talking about uh, too much protectionism or, or in relation to animals, mm -hmm. invisible protectionism. Uh, would you take time for our viewers to give your definition of how we should uh, relate to other people and animals? Well, of course, I don't know how we should, but I do, I do uh, have a new understanding about the evils of protectivism as a philosophy, as, as benign as it seems, and as beneficial as it sometimes is, uh, to, to try to solve our problems through protectivism alone uh, it probably gets us into deeper problems than it would otherwise. For example, we have tried to protect uh, uh, segments of our population, women and children, who we knew were uh, being uh, abused and mistreated. We protect women by uh, trying to uh, make it impossible for them to carry heavy packages or, or uh, work without a coffee break or work over time and they have to have a cot in their restroom. That's called protective legislation. Now, the consequence of that, of course, has been to create an idea of what women can do that has made it very difficult for them to assume any managerial or leadership responsibilities, because you can't, you can't give leadership responsibilities to somebody who has to have a cot in her restroom. And so you're in a funny situation there. Now, we... Uh, Men need those cots just as much, in some ways, I suppose. Uh, that has protected women into poverty. About 40% of the women who are raising children by themselves are working under poverty wages. Uh, it's backfired, in a sense. It does every time. Uh, the protection of children has had the same effect. Children are now so segregated, so protected, their lives are so standardized, they are so programmed, they are so attended to in the sense of doing what's good for them, 
that they now are uh, nothing short of incapacitated. Being a child is like being disabled in our society because they have no access to anything. They can't have anything like living up to their potential. They can't spurt ahead in any area. They can't, they're not, they're totally immobilized because we have to protect them from the things we've invented. We protect a child from an automobile because, you see, when I think of myself as a parent, I think of myself taking my child's hand and helping him across the street, for example. That makes me feel like a parent. It's protecting him. Now, what I don't realize is that the reason I have to do that is that I and others put that car and that street out in front, that speeding car coming down it, which makes it necessary for me to do that. Now, that not only makes it necessary for me to take the child's hand, but I have to actually do a 24-hour surveillance of that child in my backyard or in my home. That asks of us a new kind of parenthood that is totally unknown in culture or in any other cultures in history. Uh, but we do it thinking it's natural. It's a protectivist idea about thing that that has backfired and made our lives much more much more difficult. I'm always suspicious of any protectivism that takes place in any human affair, and particularly now I'm I think we're beginning to see that our protection of the earth is not simply uh, a, a protection. Uh, you have to you have to take another mentality to it. Uh, uh, protection of wildlife may be the same thing. We don't protect it from the wildlife's point of view at all. Not that we can take that point of view easily. But I do have for other humans a sort of a rule of thumb, and that is that the protection most people need is a protection of their rights, a particularly protection from the very people who would do to them what they think is good for them. Uh, people like us. Children need protection from people who think they know what's good for them, just like all of us. I mean, that's the, that's the idea of civil rights, is to be protected not just from bad people, but from anybody who thinks they are going to do you some good, whether you want it done to you or not. That's, of course, every totalitarian government thinks it's doing something good for the people, and they, they feel that they have the right to do it. So civil rights are always protection of rights. But we don't go about our civil rights mostly that way, particularly when it comes to these populations like women and children and animals. Animals, after all, are adored. We love them. We take care of them. Always be suspicious when you think you don't have to protect the rights of an animal because, in general, we love animals. If you look at what we really do to animals, killing them by the millions, hundreds of millions every year, uh, and uh, torturing them uh, incredibly, uh, they're not well protected from us by the fact that we are animal lovers. Bob Brown. <clears throat> what does your alternative then say to the child protection laws that we have in this country concerning working in the factory and so forth? Do you, uh, do you see that if, if we did not have those laws, would we go backward in time? Do you see that? Uh, you said that any laws, any protection laws you think are, are questionable or suspect. Uh, how would you keep an unscrupulous uh, industrial tycoon from having children in the mine or working with sulfur or whatever they were doing back in the 1800s? What, what is your alternative to that? Well, of course, in the, in the years when we developed those child labor laws, uh, all people were working under terrible conditions. Uh, adults and children alike. It's more pathetic when you see the 10-year-old and 12-year-old children with rickets in the mines having to breathe those awful fumes and so forth. But all people worked those terrible long hours, 80 hours a week. Uh, they worked under um, incredible uh, conditions now. Uh, the, I, I tend to believe that, that the uh, that we would benefit a good deal, certainly children would benefit, if we uh, rethought our child labor laws and uh, began to permit children to have economic independence, manage their financial affairs, work, uh, be uh, in a position to, uh, to function uh, in the world, uh, making contracts and uh, buying and selling and so forth. It's, I know that sounds 
crazy to people. As a matter of fact, it's the most disturbing of all the children's rights issues, more than sexual freedom or, or corporal punishment or any of the other issues. The idea of economic power, power for children is more disturbing than, say, voting power or anything else. Uh, but uh, we, uh, we find that uh, keeping them out of the job market is not benefiting children. That's, that's not what it's designed to, designed to do, even. I mean, it's designed to keep the job market small. Could I ask you, uh, would you suggest any approximate age that you're talking about? For example, we talk about children, that's zero to 18, supposedly. Okay. Uh, when I, we talk about letting children have, making economic contracts and working, uh, approximately what age are you talking about? Well, that always seems like a, a, the, uh, the right question to ask because uh, uh, no question that we do develop certain capabilities. However, rights themselves are not something that should be uh, granted only on the basis of age, it seems to me. I'm really talking about birth rights, that is, rights from birth. Now, granted, some children would not be able to take advantage of some of the rights they have, just like some old people and some others of our society can't take advantage of certain rights that they have. But we only deprive those people of rights when we are quite confident that their exercising of those rights would be very dangerous to themselves or to us. I think we have to make that kind of case for children. And uh, I don't think we can make that case. See, if we granted children the right to vote, for example, we, we don't have to really worry that they will vote for some big rock candy mountain. Uh, the chances are that it will follow the pattern that has always happened when we enfranchise any group. And, and whenever we do that, it, a good case is made that those people are not capable of making intelligence judgments. When we enfranchise blacks, that certainly was the case. They were animals on the plantation. Uh, women were the same, same situation. Uh, and what happened in each instance is that they voted not to disrupt the thing, but to, to they voted with their own, uh, to the extent that we permitted blacks to vote. They voted with southern white conservatives. They have for 100 years. They're only now beginning to see that the possibility they might vote in their own self-interest. Women are the same way. For 50 years, they voted with the men in their lives. It had, didn't change the voting patterns hardly at all. Uh, if we had women, the children voting, the ones that wanted to vote, uh, I imagine they'd vote with their families. Janelle Albert. Do you predict that the Equal Rights Amendment will become effective? And if so, um, how do you view it as changing our lives? Well, I have a hunch that it's not going to make it by 79. The chances are pretty slim, it seems to me. It only has a very slim chance now. There's nothing much coming up in the next couple of years until 79, and then only a very few states are, remain. And they need three more states. Uh, in some ways, I hope it doesn't pass secretly. I kind of hope. I'm for it. Don't misunderstand me. But now I'm beginning to see that by passing as a slim margin, it won't be as effective as uh, in, in the raising of our consciousness, because it's essentially a consciousness raising uh, bill, I think. Most of the legislation is already in the books on, on most of the issues. But uh, I think what will happen if there is a rejection of the ERA, is such a wave of feeling and a resurgence of concern among women and among people who are sympathetic with the movement that it will actually have a bigger impact on consciousness and probably on legislation than the, uh, than the amendment itself. Some feminists, you know, have not been for the amendment because they think it's an outrage that 53% uh, of the population should be applying to the other minority group for equal rights. So there are even feminist arguments against it, but uh, uh, I'm, I'm actually for it. I, I advocate it, but I'm, I'm now facing the possibility that it might not pass. But. Some opponents have uh, argued that it does not protect women or would remove certain protections that women have traditionally uh, been thought to enjoy. Yes. Uh, how do you feel about those areas? I think it would re remove those protections, and I think that that would be 
uh, experienced by a number of women as a penalty. Do you think it would be to an advantage or to a disadvantage, actually? Well, see, I, you know my feelings about protection. I think yes. protection is not, it, it has an underside, and the underside is a very serious one. I think that we very seldom benefit when people try to protect us. And women in particularly have, have suffered. Women make half of what men make, uh, even today, in, uh, in their jobs, even though they are fully qualified and they're capable of making more. Now that situation is uh, an incredible situation. Uh, I, I really do believe we need legislation, we're beginning to get it, that will end that kind of discrimination. Would you think that the Equal Rights Amendment would remove those areas in the law which are in fact protective, restrictive, if you want to use that terminology, uh, would the Equal Rights Amendment remove those once and for all on, on a similar basis across the nation? rather than going out at piecemeal, as, as we have been doing. Of course, there have been many strides in a piecemeal fashion, but some states still have protective uh, work laws and so forth. Well, in each case, once we get the amendment, of course, it'll be uh, the, the job of the courts to interpret and test and, uh, and take it one at a time anyway. Of course, they, it, it is it does give that, it sort of bends the nail over, in a sense, to give that amendment. And I think it's very valuable to have in that, in that regard. But uh, I don't think it's all of a sudden, I don't think all of a sudden we're going to see any difference. Just the law doesn't work that way. There are certain things that it might work in, but it's a, it's a, it's a blanket law. It doesn't have a specificity to it. So, uh, and, and most of the legislation is already there, so it, I don't think we would know the difference real fast. I don't think that's the way it would work. I wish we could get it. I hope it passes. But there's part of me that sort of says, I, you know, it's sort of a brinksmanship kind of move. I sort of think, well, God, what would happen? And I, I can't believe there wouldn't be just tremendous. I don't think it'll just be a falling into despair. I think it'll be a real anger developed from a lot of women's groups. In conjunction with uh, Janelle Burt's question, I would like to ask a most philosophical one, and I've asked this over the years and uh, have found the answers most interesting. As certainly a person who's researched and, and is very humanistic and cares, why do you think that there are groups of people on this planet that discriminate, hate, and, and have great dislikes for people of other races or, or someone of a religion uh, different from their own? Um, what causes such discrimination and hatred of one group of human beings to another one? Uh, I would like to get your answer to that. Well, <laughs> you ask the big questions, and uh, you know perfectly well that I don't have the answer to that question. We, we, if we only understood the roots of prejudice, and uh, I mean, they're still wide divergence of opinion on how it all happens. There's, there are still people who argue that it is fundamentally biological and, uh, and racially inherited. And uh, uh, if you ask Margaret Mead, she will say, uh, look, uh, uh, people have always been afraid of darkness, blackness. Uh, of course we are of course we have an immediate reaction to black because black is dark black has always been danger for us now uh, there are thousands of anthropologists who would not agree with her and uh, will say this is purely a learned uh, thing you get it from your parents you grow up without it completely and it is entirely socially conditioned uh, it is reversible you can get over it and so forth uh, nobody really knows. And the problem is that it, it gets bound up with all kinds of ideologies. We can't really look at the situation because to investigate it and try to talk sense about it is likely to infuriate one group or another for ideological concerns. So you can't, we, ju we just can't really ask a question because we can't afford the answer. Uh, take, for example, stereotype. Supposing I said to you, the problem with stereotype is not that it's inaccurate. The problem with it, that it is that it's a terrible thing to do to people. Now, you've been told, and we've all been told, that the problem with stereotypes is that they're wrong. But the thing about stereotypes is that they're probably accurate. 
That is, they are our shorthand way of, of getting through life. We make quick judgments and have to in order to get learned. So we do all kinds of stereotyping. Some of them are racial stereotyping or religious stereotyping. Or, but the stereotyping is shorthand. It is, it's, the problem with it isn't that it's inaccurate. The problem is that it's self-confirming and that it works a terrible injustice on the people we do it to because it imprisons them individually in a, in a stereotype that they can't get out of. But we try to say that there's no reason to believe those things. Well, there is reason to believe them. There is the, it is an accurate one. So what we're asked to do is to, is to take a, a position different from what we know to be in our own experience and what, uh, what we've been taught to be uh, a, a, an effective way of operating and ask to, for moral reasons, to do it otherwise. And that's, of course, what we have to do. We have to do it for moral reasons. That's the, that's the problem. I mean, I uh, carry this one step further, and I'll return to the panel. Uh, in several occasions, I have had the opportunity to have in-depth discussions on political issues, major economic issues, or theological issues with individuals that are quite dogmatic. But when you have the opportunity to talk with them in depth, they will admit that it's complex and they do not have all the answers. Yet those individuals will behave in daily life in such a way as demand that you follow a certain dogma. Why this inconsistency of, you know, in, in deep philosophical discussion, yes, I don't have the answers, but yes, in our laws and in our daily life, I demand that you follow a certain path. I don't know. I, I'm as bad as anyone else in, in being given over to uh, causes and to ideological positions. I'll tell you personally what I would like to be able to do is to free myself up from the people I admire most, the people who I regard as wisest in this world, are people who are least dogmatized and least committed to ideological positions, but are able to keep many balls in the air at once, who uh, enjoy paradox, who love to think about the inconsistencies, and who can live with those. But it's very difficult for Americans particularly to live with inconsistency because the pressure for us to give answers, pressure for us to solve problems, because we think everything is dividable up into problems in, in America, which they aren't. Uh, the, the, the pressure, on, just for example, mass media, right now what's happening to us on television is because of the time constraints, because of the expectations the viewer has, because of how this is being sandwiched in between other things which, which are giving snappy answers, whether it's TV commercials <coughs> or entertainment shows or whatever it is, the pace of it requires of us just to keep the viewer's attention. It requires of us that we have to do something snappy. And, this, and the complex answer is just never snappy. So we are... We, you can understand how all of us are drawn to giving the simplistic and unfortunately a lot of us are kind of utopian zealots anyway and we keep thinking well we're going to cast everything in these ideological simplistic terms when if you really pursue it with any of us we know perfectly well that these issues are so paradoxical and complex that we can't begin to do it and there's hardly an issue that is of any importance that is a profound issue in which that's not the case. Bob Brown. I'd love to pursue this, but I, I was thinking about shows like Archie Bunker and asking, you know, if, if you uh, think, you, you hear some people say, well, shows like Archie Bunker point out, or the All in the Family, point out uh, the ridiculousness of, of prejudice and stereotyping. And then on the other hand, they did some studies, and apparently they're they afraid that shows like this are actually reinforcing prejudice. They, they did, yeah. once they, they found that people identify so much with Archie Bunker mm -hmm. that actually was reinforcing. But now, maybe I'm, I'm wrong, but it seems to me like in the last two or three years, I've noticed on some television shows the, the, uh, an increasing frequency to, uh, I'm thinking of shows like Maud and some of these, where they're, they're really moving out of that early television uh, where suddenly every black man was a doctor and every black woman was, you know, the perfect mother. And, and they're moving out of that into where they're actually showing bad and good and whatever. Now, do you think that this is going to have some effect in terms of, of, of trying to eliminate stereotyping? We're simply saying, well, there are good people and bad people and some happen to be 
brown, white, or red, or whatever. Do you think that's going to have a... I, I guess what I'm really trying to say is, do you think television mm -hmm. is going to, to be able to break through this, this uh, problem of, of prejudice better than any other media that we've used in the past? I don't think so. I, I would like to think that it has that impact, but I don't think it does. It, uh, it's greatly overrated as an influence, as influential as it is. And uh, we all spend thousands of hours at it. And uh, there's no question that it is in the shaping of a child's mind, more important, say, than the father is in the family. Not as important as the mother, but it's more important than the father. Uh, it, it does have a tremendous impact. I don't mean to dismiss it. But if you're asking me whether or not it can make a real contribution to the uh, relieving of the and writing of the racial injustices of the past, that's not my experience with it. I just don't think it. Take a, take a program like Roots, for example. 130 million people watch it for eight nights in a row. Uh, incredibly powerful, uh, melodramatic, uh, provocative, uh, even inflammatory kind of thing. And uh, there's almost no impact. There wasn't even a, I mean, a few high school kids were chanting about roots and roots, but there was no, we have so stabilized the, apparently stabilized the racial situation now. We've made virtually no progress in the last 25 years with respect to righting those racial wrongs. We still don't see black faces in our white audiences. Uh, we, we have very little uh, uh, um, uh, amelioration of those, of those problems. I, I'm, I'm sorry that we don't, but I don't see television as, uh, as a, I think it's a very powerful medium, but it's probably been given credit for more power than it actually has. We have two preschool children, other well, ones in the first grade now, and my wife is a teacher, and we both have observed a fantastic difference in our two younger children versus our older child from public television, that's to say Sesame Street, um, uh, Electric Company, I don't mean to be giving plugs to these uh -huh. programs, but uh, anyway, these programs and their reading ability and so forth now, I know that television has a tremendous impact. I mean, uh, when it's used in that way, it, yes. it, it has to. Now, I guess my real question is, what could we do, in your opinion, as you know, a psychologist, that there would, uh, is it the programming on, on Sesame Street that is different than Roots? Is it the, the constant repetition? Uh, what, what would you say that, it can have impact, I know, I mean, uh, it can have impact. impact. Sesame Street does, uh, but you know, curiously, the, the studies of Sesame Street show that it has actually widened the gap between blacks and whites, because you see, it's broadcast to everyone. It's intended for the ghetto black. That's the invention of the thing, was about that, to permit people who had difficulties with the English and with the school system as it exists, uh, to give them a leg up on the situation so they'd be a little, have a head start in a sense. Well, what's happened really is that everybody watches that, and the white children, who are better positioned in the first place to learn, are able to get it faster, and it helps them more than the black children. So. So that the, when they get to the schools, while they both may have been helped some, the discrepancy is even greater. Now, that's happened to us every time we've tried to make educational innovations. We, because no matter how, how much we give to blacks with respect to scholarships and so forth, and, and the, as long as we keep adding new degrees on, so you can't get by now with a bachelor's degree, you need a master's degree or a PhD or something. So the further out of reach we make, those advanced degrees. So it, it is not working. That system is not working. Um, who knows what's going to work? It's just that you can't say, well, just because now I'm seeing blacks on television. Uh, yes, it did cure the invisible man problem. Now the black child grows up seeing images, seeing models. And I think that's very important. But to put our confidence that that ultimately is going to make a big difference we live in cities now where people have lots of contact with races, where they are really interdependent as, as races. And yet the very connection that is made there is ultimately isolating. And uh, the cities do not have real uh, intimate 
and affectionate and uh, social relations among races still, even though there's high interdependence. It's, it's not worked that way. It's a discouraging picture. Ladies and gentlemen, for you who might have joined us late, our guest today on the program is Dr. Richard Farson, who is a psychologist holding a PhD in that field and is known as a futurist uh, about uh, rights of individuals and uh, children, women, uh, and uh, other animals uh, within our society. We'll continue the questioning with Janelle Burke. We as Americans live with an, a number of laws that deal with the victimless crime, so to speak, mm -hmm. uh, marijuana, prostitution, etc. What is your opinion of these laws? Well, I, I think that uh, we are greatly over-legalized in America. We now look to legal solutions for practically everything. Unfortunately, we have allowed ourselves to believe in that too much. We put too much confidence in. I think that uh, practically everything that is, quote, victimless, it's not even, I think it's better to call them crimeless crimes. And most of them are cr not crimes at all. They're just but deviations from what we think ought to happen. And uh, I believe that that has worked very much against us. I believe that we should decriminalize all of sex. Uh, I think we should uh, probably decriminalize all of what's called vice now. And uh, uh, those are the, the so-called victimless crimes. I can't see any real benefit to I think it's actually worked the other way. It has created so much crime. The, the laws connected with drug abuse have created so much crime because people have to steal in order to get the money to get the expensive drugs that would be cheap if they could get them otherwise and that sort of thing. And I, I just don't think it's worked that way. It works very much to the benefit of the law enforcement agencies that would like the laws because it really keeps those things going. We have a very funny situation. about. We really have a, such a crazy idea of how our law enforcement situation works. But if you really look at the way what happens is that, is that practically every criminal is at large. We do not have a legal system or a law enforcement system or a penal system that keeps the criminal out of society and or in any way discourages them. If anything, the whole system promotes the very thing it's trying to do. So. It's probably true that only one or two percent of all the people who are criminals in our society, even the most dangerous ones, are incarcerated anywhere. The rest of them are at large. So if you, if you emptied all the prisons, you, if you had 100, 100 people in your community that were criminals, the, the number would go to about 102, something like that. It's just not, it's, it's, it's a crazy, it's a crazy situation and we are, it's an invisible one to us. It's, it's mythical, the way it works. Another one of your areas that you have written a lot on is the family and uh, what you feel the future will be. Would you take time to give us your opinions on what you perceive within the family in years that lie ahead? Well, of course, what we think about in terms of family life is alternative forms. That we think of child exchange programs, of swapping married couples, of temporary marriages, five-year contracts, of non-marriages, of communal living, and all those kinds of forms. The form we don't think much about is the Archie Bunker form. That is the, the old-fashioned extended family. Uh, and when we see it on television, it looks outrageous to us. It's so, it's so uh, uh, demeaned as a, as a kind of family. But actually, there's an awful lot that we have lost in our family from our the meaning of that. And so my hope is that the family of the future will be able to recover some of it. Now, it's not that we can turn the clock back or that we'd want to go back to some miserable patriarchal situation of that sort. But in a family where roles are clear, where structures are strong, where tradition is powerful, and those things can be done in and appreciated in in variety of different different ways but when that happens actually more intimacy more expressiveness more creativity and more genuineness among authenticity you might call it, among people can happen because you see the roles protect us from each other when we 
When we abandon roles, when we abandon structure, when we try to make everything visible, when we try to bring everything out in the open, people are not protected from each other, therefore they have to protect themselves from involuntary expression of things. And, uh, and, those, and so I'm hopeful that we won't throw over tradition for tradition's sake. Because even if a tradition is wrong, even if it doesn't make any sense, it may be worthwhile to keep just because it's tradition. And because in a traditional framework, an awful lot of good things can happen among people. So, well, yes, we have to, we have to, to think over and probably dismiss a lot of those things that are ter traditions that are terribly victimizing, for example, in the sex role traditions and in the way in which we viewed children. I am now uneasy about throwing them out too, too quickly because we pay a terrible price for them. Bob Brown. Let's return to animals again. Uh, yeah. On animal experimentation, uh, would you discuss some of the things that are done? Uh, I think many of our viewers may not be aware you know, of what some of the experiments are done. And would you discuss the alternatives to uh, experiment with animals. In other words, uh, for example, uh, you mentioned uh, thalidomide and, and so forth. Uh, would you just go into some of those? Uh, well, of course, the, uh, we, we, we kill 100 million animals a year in various kinds of testing and experimentation and demonstrations. Not all those are medical. And not all those are, the, many of them are cosmetics and food products and things of that sort. Uh, so we have to decide as a society how important it is to kill rabbits or, or whatever to test uh, eyeshadow or, uh, or uh, hairspray or whatever. Uh, beyond that, though, we have to come to grips with our own survival and uh, to the extent that we believe in, in the progress that Western medicine has made, and an awful lot of us believe in that, uh, we have to say some of that is going to have to involve the ex experimentation on humans and animals, and there are risks, and there are moral codes that have got to be rethought with in connection with it. We now do it rather indiscriminately for the most trivial questions that we uh, people ask. We you know we'll break a break a cat's tail to see if there's any any neural system in the tail. Now you can't say that's exactly trivial, but I think we've got to be very sure that whatever we're doing is can be justified and defended to, uh, to a, a gr group of people who have the animal's interests at heart. Uh, the, a lot of medical progress has been made without animal experimentation. The whole connection between smoking and cancer, for example, was discovered without the use of uh, where it could be it could be done without the use of animals. Uh, the all of Dar Charles Darwin's advances uh, certainly were made without killing animals. And uh, the thalid thalidomide thing you're talking about that was tested on animals and it's shown to be safe, and then found out that the humans uh, wasn't safe. And uh, so we've been misled by such experiments too. So it's not it's not an easy one. I certainly am not for against all animal experimentation. I'm for survival. I would eat another animal if it was necessary for me to survive, I'll tell you that. But I don't eat animals now. Uh, frequently, people say, well, it's all right because, you know, dumb animals, it doesn't matter. Uh, what would be your reaction to, if, say, if, if superior beings from another planet came to this planet, uh, had marked uh, greater intelligence, and wanted to eat us? because on the same theory. Do you think there would be uh, any reaction to that from people? <laughs> there would be from me. <laughs> I'd do what I could to get away. But if they were superior, they'd probably eat me. And that doesn't seem fair, does it? Uh, it, is a, it is a good question to ask, because I think it's a, it does point up the, the problem for us. Or well, not the real problem, the predicament for us. What do we do about the situation where we are, quote, superior, to these forms. At least we are superior in some ways. We, knew, we do know how to control them. We can kill them easier than they can kill us. Uh, what obligation goes along with that? And uh, I think that's the issue that is going to be debated through the next decade quite strenuously, because the 
the awareness of animals is going through a big shift. And it isn't all positive. We are now getting very angry about pets in the society, about dog feces, about the billions of tons of dog feces that are dropped on America every day, and every year. And uh, uh, for the first time in my life that I can ever remember, people are openly saying that they don't like some animals. They don't like having them around. They don't like barking dogs and biting dogs and dogs nipping at their heels as they're trying to jog around. There are dogs barking when they want to go visit a friend and dogs uh, doing things to them. It's now, it's never been very popular to, to be able to say, I don't like dogs or I don't like cats. It's a lot easier to say you don't like cats than dogs. There's something about not liking dogs is like not liking America or not liking uh, some of its most cherished institutions. It's very hard to say. But people are now beginning to say that sort of thing. Well, you have to ask, where's that coming from? What, what, uh, what kind of mentality is, is beginning to develop in America about this? And I think it's going to be one which is combining with the growth of vegetarianism and our concern about the treatment of animals and the development of a new consciousness about ecology and and the wildlife uh, preservation and conservation efforts, uh, uh, all those are kind of coming together now to make this new, this new awareness. That's what it seems to me to be the case. Janelle Burt. I have three short questions about uh, this general area. I guess I'm not very good at giving short answers, are, but I'll try. Are you a vegetarian? I am. Uh, on that basis, on that grounds, I'm political, for those reasons? Political vegetarian, yeah, on, on the moral issue. Yeah. Um, I, I'm a hot fudge Sunday kind of vegetarian. <laughs> Secondly, um, uh, do you see hunting as being a thing of the past? That is, that in the future we will not enjoy hunting as a sport, hunting animals as a sport. Well, it's, it's difficult. You know, it's very hard to predict the future. The best way to predict the future is like predicting the weather. Guess what it is today and, and say that it's going to be like that tomorrow. I don't, we don't give up things as, as deep within us as hunting is. I mean, hunting, people have been hunting for thousands of years, millions of years, and as a support for thousands of years. So it's not easy to say that we're going to give that up. If you look at a group, Herman Kahn has an article in the current Co-Evolution Quarterly, which he says, among his staff, the 30 top people in his staff, none of them hunt. I think one hunts. The, the next 30, the 30 in the uh, sort of employee group, only one of them doesn't hunt. It's a very, it's, it has to do with what he calls a new class, the, this new liberal kind of mentality that probably uh, people who are on faculties of uh, colleges like you are, uh, probably members of these new classes where uh, you don't participate in the regular middle class and sometimes lower class uh, enterprises. Now, I suspect that we are going to see a shift toward non-hunting, yes. It may be by the year 2000 we will think that wearing skins is barbaric and eating meat is barbaric, but I wouldn't bet on it. What about animal population control? Well, how do we do it? Uh, taxation of uh, uh, reduced taxation for neutered animals or uh, making sure that only qualified people can have animals and things like that? It's very difficult to know how to do. Uh, I think it's probably an educational I think if, if, little children, it. if little children knew what happens to animals that are born, and uh, they, they, wouldn't, they wouldn't be so encouraged about having children, little kittens. One more question on animals. Uh, in your lecture today, you gave some examples of uh, treatment of, of animals, and particularly you were dealing with fighting dogs and, and what happened to the chickens, and so would you take a minute to explain to your audience some of the things you found in your research about how animals are treated, specific examples. Well, of course, dog fights are only done in certain geographical areas, mostly in the south, and it's, uh, it's uh, not a dominant sport like, uh, like other animals, excuse me, animal sports are, but the way they train a dog for dog fighting is to give him a little kitten, and then he's dangled in front of him, and the dog bites the kitten's legs off usually, and then 
excited by the blood, uh, bites, the, bites the head off the, the kitten, and then they get another kitten, and they keep him going, and they train him on little puppies, and then bigger puppies, and gradually he gets into a real bloodthirsty fighting spirit. That's how you train a dog, and they use up dozens of uh, kittens and puppies to do this for one dog. Uh, most people don't know that. But then even if they did know it, I suppose you can get inured to it. Just like, remember the first time you were baiting a hook with a live bait, and you thought, I don't know what you thought is, but I thought this, God, I don't know where I can put that through that eye and come out there and do that exactly. But it was only a few minutes before I was doing it just like that, just like that, throwing them over. Now we get easily inured, we, get over, we overcome those primitive first instincts. Going to bullfights is the same way. The first time you go to a bullfight, very often you think, you're siding with the bull, and then you go to the bullfights after a few times and begin to side with the matador. <laughs> it's not, it's not something that you don't get inured to. Uh, so there, are, there was terrible problems, and the raising of animals. Uh, my God, the raising of, of chickens is just uh, awful. To to think of having to live their whole lives, two years of life, crowded in a little cage. Um, with uh, five, four other full-size chickens, unable to move, unable to spread their wings ever, uh, de-beaked because they'll kill each other if they aren't. Uh, sometimes their, their feet actually grow right around, they get caught in the mesh, and the feet grow right around in the mesh so that they never move for the whole lives long. Uh, and that's done with millions, of, millions upon millions of chickens. So. Now I try to eat eggs from chickens that have the run of the place. I just don't eat eggs uh, from caged chickens. Uh, Bob Brown, a quick question. How do you determine the eggs that are from unpinned chickens? Well, when I, <laughs> eat, when I eat in a, in a hotel, I can't, of course. But uh, when I buy eggs for myself, uh, it's possible to buy eggs like that. They're marked. Okay. But that will bring our program to conclusion. Uh, uh, our guest, ladies and gentlemen, has been Dr. Richard Barson, who is a well-known psychologist from San Francisco, California, and he's been dealing uh, with numerous areas of futurism and what we're going to do in relation to one another and to other animals. On behalf of the panel, I want to express our very deep appreciation for your coming today. I enjoyed it immensely. Thank you. I also thank our panel for, again, outstanding questions. Ladies and gentlemen, may I invite you to be with us in the coming weeks when we're going to be interviewing a number of people who are visiting our campus on the various aspects of the question of water and air and land and, and the life uh, that is on our planet. I think you will be enjoying those programs, and I hope you will tune in at 6 o'clock on this station for those programs. And until next week, good evening. <laughs>